Okay, um, hello everyone. Welcome to our today's academy with Sebastian Spalazio, researcher at DFKI, the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Um, he's going to talk about the explainable AI handbook, a framework for defining and comparing all kinds of methods in the field of explainable AI. Yeah, Sebastian is curious and passionate for research and development of new AI-based technologies. He is interested in the areas of deep learning, semi-supervised learning, and explainable AI. He is currently focusing on explainable AI with applications on computer vision. So thank you for being here, Sebastian. Um, I'm very excited about your talk, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm really happy and excited to be here with you all. And well, let's dig right in. Well. For those who don't know what the DFKI is, um, as was already mentioned, it stands for the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. Of course, the letters come from the German name. And it's one of the largest, if not the largest research institute that is completely dedicated to the research of artificial intelligence, right? It's, it has offices and research uh, or centers physical centers uh, all across Germany. Uh, the main locations are in Kaiserslautern, Saarbrücken, Bremen, and we have also some offices that are in Berlin and Niedersachsen. We're in the process of expanding as well. So this is a, a very hot topic. We need more people and uh, there's a lot of funding for research in artificial intelligence. So we're also opening new offices in Trier and also in Darmstadt. So we're expanding and it's really exciting time to be doing AI. Everything that deals with AI, pretty much if you can think uh, a, a use case for AI, we probably have some group at the FKI that is doing research in it. So it's over uh, 1800 researchers at the moment. Uh, this is also a research center that has been founded in 1988. So it's, it has a long tradition um, and reputation for doing research at, in, in uh, this field. And as you can see, this is a very rough sample of what topics uh, we deal with at the FKI. Everything that has to do, for example, with augmented reality, mixed reality, everything that deals with language technologies or anything that can be used for educational purposes, controlling robots, simulated reality, something like digital twins and uh, all of this fun stuff. Uh, these are things that um, we do at the FKI. So from one of the largest centers in Kaiserslautern, there is one group called the Smart Data and Knowledge Services, and this is uh, led by Professor Andreas Dengel. Um, there is one team there that deals with multimedia analysis and data mining. Um, and this is where I come from. And this is, this is where I have been working and doing my PhD. And uh, as already said, uh, my focus has been on explainable AI, but since we are interested in multimedia, my main field of application is computer vision. But I've also had the chance of doing some other research in other fields like adversarial machine learning or trying to introduce little noise to make the, the black box that is this machine learning break. Self-supervised learning or not using the actual uh, hand annotated labels or human annotated labels and try to find auxiliary tasks that help us pre-train these models multitask learning or trying to learn different tasks with the same model and trying to figure out ways that the model can learn better from just learning two tasks at once. Curriculum learning also deals with how to set up the schedule to train the neural network, not just uh, shoving it and showing it a lot of examples at random, but how to design this curriculum to um, make it learn either faster or better or uh, with more robustness, for example. All right, so enough about me, enough about the DFKI itself. Let me then start with a story. Imagine, perhaps after this meeting, 
you want to go home and you know after a long day you're tired you just want to go home and relax with your family but the moment you arrive there are two police officers waiting for you uh, standing at the door they are there to take you into custody because they have footage where an automatic system has matched your face to a man in the video that has been robbing a store of course you didn't do it. You were here in this meeting with me. So uh, this is this is clearly a mistake. However, they take you and you have to spend time in jail. Imagine how how hard it would be for you just to endure this situation just because of a computer mistake. And at this moment, you probably be thinking, all right, this is a bit far fetched, um, kind of a very drastic scenario to be starting here to motivate the um, to motivate this uh, to the stock. And to you, I might say, this is exactly, sadly, what happened to a guy uh, two years ago called, uh, named Robert Williams, who was taken into custody in front of his family because of a mismatched or an algorithm that, that has mismatched his face to somebody else who was robbing a store. And Moreover, there was another guy also, um, as it said in 2019, Niger Parks, who also had to spend 10 days in jail and $5,000 of his own money getting the defense to get his record expunged and so on and so forth. And, you know, the problem is this, this situations arrived because of an automatic system based on artificial intelligence that uh, was later found out to have a, a bias towards uh, people of darker skin tones. It was 30% less accurate when matching faces uh, of people that yeah, had darker skin tones. And what I need you to understand here is that this is by far not an isolated problem, right? And so here's why. A lot of these state-of-the-art technology is based on this very powerful models that we have nowadays called artificial neural networks, or you might know the term machine learning, right? which is the way that we can train this artificial neural networks. These are essentially black boxes that learn to produce very complex prediction, but with impressive performance, right? So now why do we say that they are black boxes? It's essentially because the way they are being trained uh, as I mentioned before, what we do is we show them a bunch of examples and we monitor what the prediction is going to be at the end after, show, after showing the, the samples. And if it's wrong, the black box is going to automatically adapt. Right? So this box is going to automatically adapt to extract kind of a different, um, different kind of information until the predictions get better and better and more consistent. And just by doing this, so this simple idea is so effective that we have started using them for more and more critical scenarios, what we call high stakes scenarios. So think autonomous vehicles or traffic control in the biomedical domain for uh, researching new drugs and in court to determine whether somebody is likely to flee if they're put on bail and the banking industry for determining whether you are uh, granted a loan for your house, for your car, whatever, uh, things that can have a real impact on somebody's life, right? And now think of the medical domain where you can already take a picture with your phone, for example, or uh, doctors might have specialized software that by taking an image of your skin, they can already predict whether a spot in your skin corresponds to a cancerous area or not. And so what happens if these things are unreliable or start um, having these kind of biases towards one population or just for you in particular. The problem is that we are now in a situation where we don't, we have a basic understanding of the system, but we don't really know exactly what kind of information there is in the input or what is the relevant information of the input that should be extracted to make the decision. And at the same time, we also don't know exactly what kind of information is this black box 
extracting, right? Because it has been trained automatically. It has been adapting automatically. So um, these, these are enough to motivate the use of machine learning over other technologies, but they're not nearly enough when it comes to justified predictions that are made by these models. So we, are, we have to start searching mechanisms to justify the predictions that these models are doing, especially when we're thinking on these high stakes scenarios where everywhere um, neural network and machine learning models are being implemented, right? There is unfortunately a barrier to find these effective mechanisms, right? Usually we call them explanations, but the problem is in the community, in the machine learning community, or even uh, in, in the larger scope of the community where, where we are, we cannot agree on what we're looking for. So exactly what means uh, what it means to have an explanation. So me as a researcher, for example, I can think about the problem or the structure of the problem and then concoct some sort of um, alternative statistic or a visualization that I can tell you about that decision and I can just call it an explanation. But we see, we're gonna see how this is problematic, right? There is, for example, one typical one when working with images uh, what we call the tension maps or heat maps, and we call them an explanation. And this might be well accepted uh, if you have been reading about or working with uh, explainable methods. You have probably heard of uh, attention mechanisms or uh, feature relevance maps, and this might be problematic. Um, and uh, I'll show you an example in a in a second. But for now, talking going back to the idea of the agreement, the lack of agreement in uh, the literature for what an explanation is and what it's not. This is kind of a very brief survey of literature, scientific literature uh, that has been dedicated to analyzing what uh, explainability is, what counts as an explanation, what it means to have an interpretation. And if you go through that, we're not gonna go one by one. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, but the important thing to notice is that they are very different. Some of them might agree to some, um, to some level, but fundamentally, they, sometimes they have um, very different meanings. Right? And, and this is a problem. Right? So if the researchers on this field don't agree, then this means that everyone is essentially working on slightly different problems or completely different problems, depending on the definition. Right? And this is highly problematic, especially when thinking about industry standards or governance. Right? So imagine we're going to have an autonomous vehicle and we need some sort of standard uh, for, for the AI to justify a, a camera mounted system that detects whether we have traffic signs at view and, or not and what kind of traffic signs it is. And if we have an, a, stand, a standard for that, it would have to stick to one of the definitions or, or not. If, if we uh, implement different systems based on different definitions, then that's gonna be problematic. The same for the government who wants to pass law, and you probably are familiar with this GDPR um, law framework, that you know, they, they have to stick at some point to one of these, but the research is, has not agreed on what actually counts. So depending on what we choose, it might be better for ones, better for the others. We don't know, but we still haven't agreed. And that's the largest problem, right? So now let me get back to the, um, to the uh, example of attention maps, as I was mentioning before. This is one of the well-accepted versions of what an explanation might look like. But if, imagine we stick to this and there, there's gonna be problems and I'm gonna show you how. A very simple example, we have an image classifier and I pass an image through it and it predicts Siberian Husky, which is the correct prediction. So the, the model was correct. But now somebody comes from the government or even yourself, if you're curious, and then you say, well, what's the evidence of that model uh, or the evidence that we have that this model made the decision because of the right 
um, the right reasons, right? And what we have with these attention maps is we create a heat map of the pixels in this image that were most important for making the decision on Siberian Husky. And this is what it might look like. This might make a lot of sense, right? So we see here there's a red area indicating that the pixels around the, the, the face of the dog were the most relevant. So it, it does make sense intuitively to us that, that the, the decision, at least according to this criterion, is the right one. Now, there are some researchers that have thought a little bit more about this and thought, well, this is not the entire picture and this is still problematic. So this, this cannot really count as an explanation because if I just start to look for evidence of any other uh, kind of um, objects, let's see, we look for something that is completely unrelated. Let's say a traversal flute, an instrument. And then we see that the heat map that is produced it's essentially the same, right? It's a little bit shifted, but it's essentially the same. So we cannot, now we're a little bit skeptical, right? So what's the evidence enough? And this is one of the main critiques that uh, Professor Princeton, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Cynthia Rudin, uh, whose famous research in the area of explainability um, has cited and say, well, you know, stop doing that because this is not the entire story. Uh, you have to keep in mind that knowing where the network is paying attention is not telling you the, the whole story, right? It tells you where it's looking, but not what it's doing with that part of the image, right? which is arguably something way more important than just knowing where. So this is just one kind of explanation and one limitation that we have with this one. So this is the risk of just sticking to one of those existing definitions. Uh, there are some other discussions and caveats for some other definitions, like having surrogate models to explain more complex models, linearizing uh, decisions of nonlinear models, all kind of fun stuff. They all have their, um, their caveats. So what to do, right? So this is what we did. We stopped thinking, uh, we stopped for a second and then started thinking, how can we define a proper framework that you know, can encompass all the contributions that, has, that have been done in this area of artificial or uh, explainable artificial intelligence. So we start by defining kind of our main goal. Since there are so many uh, contributions, we need a framework that is both commensurable and universal. What do I mean by that? First of all, commensurable means that um, we can measure uh, you can use, we can use the same measure to compare different things. And universal means, well, that hopefully all of those contributions can be measured in some way, right? Which, which sounds kind of uh, a little bit paradoxical, right? If they're so different, how can I find a way to compare them? So what we want to do is have a frame of reference, a language to talk about explainable AI. And for that, we need to define what an explanation is, what an interpretation is. So let me walk through uh, the, the framework and see how we come up with it and, and develop that language to talk about explainable AI and what an explanation is and what an interpretation is. We have to start by realizing or thinking a lot on how we solve problems with this wonderful tool that is machine learning and artificial neural networks. So let us start with the main, main general idea, what we call the high level domain. So this is you and me talking. And then we say, we want to have a system, a computer system that is able to classify a bunch of images uh, and, and the objects that appear in those images. Let's say I want, uh, all the images of chicken that get classified as chicken and everything else as everything else, or images of tigers as images of tigers, right? So the class tiger. By giving you this definition, I think everybody, pretty much everybody would be more or less in, this, in, in line with what I want. And uh, those, those requirements kind of are clear to us. Now, we need to translate that informal definition to something more formal so that a computer can deal with it, right? And this is what we do. We map it to what we call the low level domain or the formal domain, right? 
and we start defining a bunch of things, right? So we see here a formal definition, a model, and a prediction. What we're doing here is essentially define the structure of the problem. So here we're defining the structure of the input and the output. And this would be a function, it's a mapping, and so on and so forth. Then here we we'll define the model with the architecture, for example, the neural network, how many layers, how many neurons, what kind of nonlinear activations, all that fun stuff. And then how we're gonna correct it, how, how the model is gonna um, correct itself or adjust itself automatically uh, whenever the predictions are wrong and so on. And here, for example, some uh, extra formatting uh, for the output so we can read it in certain ways. And so we are defining the structure of the problem. And then after we have, of course, uh, everything here defined, once we start seeing results, we, we basically read them from here, right? And, and we're gonna go back to that, uh, to this idea and revisit this arrow in a few slides. But for now, we just basically read it and confront it to our expected result. So if I have this image and I expect it to be classified as chicken, but now let's assume the model is trained and everything worked fine until I show him this image and now it says tiger. Now I'm faced with um, this, uh, this dichotomy here or this, this confusion, this source of confusion where I need to know why. For me, it's very clear that this image is not a tiger. Why did it say tiger? Now, I have to then start thinking what kind of information needs to be extracted or, uh, or needed to be extracted from here to uh, that, that is actually not being represented here, right? So clearly something went wrong while processing this image and somewhere here along this structure, it wasn't captured. We now need to think in retrospective about uh, what kind of information wasn't well represented by this model, right? And then we start thinking, for example, um, if, the, if the pixels that were more important for the decision were actually the ones that are inside the chicken itself, or was it because of something in the background, right? So that might be the initial thing if you are a fan still of heat maps and feature attention maps, you might start thinking along those terms. So what we are doing is realizing, first of all, that because of the way we define the structure, we have forgone a lot of what we called uh, requirements and um, specifications of that task that we have simplified because we hope that the data that we use to train this model uh, and the model itself capture all the necessary information. But now when we start seeing errors, we see we realize, well, yeah, something went amiss. There is something missing. So what it is. So we start thinking about this, this kind of what we call the non-functional requirements. What, what kind of information should have been conveyed, but it's probably not. We still don't know, but we start making conjectures, right? So for example, this, this idea of looking for the foreground pictures, uh, uh, sorry, foreground pixels or background pixels. So we call this non-functional requirements. We borrow this term from software development. And now we go into the realm of explainable AI. Now that we have this non-functional requirement kind of stated in this high level domain, I want to look for the foreground pixels. Now I can go again back into the formal domain uh, and look for uh, evidence that the pixels in the foreground were the most important or were the backgrounds, right? And this will be a, a feature attention, a feature relevance algorithm. So this is exactly what we call then an explanation is this method to based on a non-functional requirement is going to map anything uh, that we have in the uh, low level um, in the in the low level uh, definition and we're going to map it um, and see if there is evidence of it right so here comes our first definition of explanation uh, which we in very generic terms we call it the process of describing one or more facts right so describing me means mapping whatever came from the formal definition, from the model, from the intermediate activations, from everything we had um, into this other method that is gonna look for evidence, right? So it's gonna kind of extract uh, or condense information, transcribe information that was already here uh, with statistics that can, uh, where we can find evidence that this non-functional requirement is actually being met or not. 
right? So um, it's very generic, but this is the purpose uh, to guarantee universality, right? So this is a little bit of the, um, the language that we use to not confuse what uh, the input to the explanation is. The explanation is we call the process of mapping uh, all of these uh, low level domains and, um, and the, the input is called the explanandum. The output is called the explanance, but this is just more uh, formality just to prevent uh, confusion uh, between what the process or the inputs and the outputs, right? Now let's talk a little bit about this last arrow here that I have to bend a little bit to fit in the, in the graphic. When we say that I have this prediction and then I just read it, right? I was grossly oversimplifying because there's a lot going on here, right? There is, there's a translation that happens from the low level domain to the high level domain. So here, let me give you an example. For example, uh, let's say we have this image and then we process it through the neural network and it is, it is already trained and so on. For those of you who know a little bit more about the, the technique uh, and the technical parts, you know that this prediction might look for a classification problem like a vector or like a histogram where any of these indices is gonna represent one of the classes that I'm interested in. For example, zero might correspond to a chicken, one might correspond to a tiger, two might correspond to a house, three might correspond to an ostrich, et cetera, et cetera. And we have um, agreed that the way we read this uh, histogram is that the highest one, the one with, a, with a, um, the highest number, uh, in this case, if we, if we do something like a softmax normalization and whatnot, this can be read as a probability. And then the maximum is the one that we're gonna decide it's the predicted class of the model, right? And this definition is kind of agreed upon and we found it useful and we all accept it, right? But in that process, what we did was we assigned meaning to this histogram. This histogram is just a, an array of numbers. But we have, um, we have agreed that uh, this is the way that we are gonna interpret this, um, this number or this, this array. And this is what we call now an interpretation. So this would be um, an assignment of meaning to an explanation, right? In this context of uh, explainable AI, of course, uh, we're just gonna assign meaning to the result of the explanation because we assume that the, the model had already uh, this, this mapping, this assignment of meaning, which I just described, right? What we are still missing is, well, the output of this uh, explanation process is still in the low level domain and needed something like a, a way to read it back into the high level domain where we are discussing ideas where we can check, do I get the loan or not? Is this spot cancerous or not? And, and for that, we need to define interpretation as the assignment of meaning. All right. Now, what happens when the person reading this result is, for example, a zoologist or you know, a veterinarian? They have expert knowledge on the field, and they might read this result in a different way to the way I could read it as a, let's say, as a, as a computer scientist. Right, and then they can say, well, if, uh, if it says a chicken, but it was also likely that it was an ostrich for the purpose of my uh, job, I was uh, just interested in seeing if uh, it had wings. I'm just making a wild example, but it's, it shows the way that an expert might condition their, um, their reading of that result. But if I'm a computer scientist, I can also think on the structure of the model or whether there were biases in the data or if the normalization was right or not, et cetera, et cetera. So the conditions uh, that uh, the mental models of the, each user has is different. And we say that the mental model of the person consuming the, interpret uh, the, the explanation uh, is gonna condition the interpretation or the definition that I'm gonna give to these low level primitives, all right? So, okay, we uh, then expand a little bit the definition of explanation because um, what we ultimately want is that the consumer of that uh, explanation uh, understands more about 
the decision process of the model. Right? So we have now our two um, principal definitions on which we, we build this whole framework. And essentially that's it, right? So what we have here is defined a language, a very generic language to talk about contributions in XAI. Basically everything that, that is called nowadays an explanation method feels, uh, um, fills this spot here, right? So uh, it falls into this category. And, and now we can know and identify the different parts, the components of that method, right? And talk about it. And now we can compare it, right? So this is uh, the next thing that I wanna talk about. How do we use this framework usually? So without going into too much technical detail, let's assume that you have two explanations or two, um, two methods, two XAI methods. Let's say I'm gonna throw here some names, GradCam and kernel Shap. It really doesn't matter if you don't know them. Uh, you just need to know that they're two fundamentally different ways of generating explanations, right? Or two different explanations to use our framework. And now what we do is we have our uh, XAI handbook or our framework in mind. And then we start asking uh, different questions that apply to both, right? So things like, what is the input to that explanation? Right, so what is the input that uh, GradCam uses and what is the input of kernel shaft? Is it the actual input to the model or is it something uh, intermediate result that happens uh, or that, are, that spits out when the model is processing the data, is transforming it in some way? What is the output of the explanation, right? So what is also the format? Do we get a heat map, which would be a two dimensional signal for images? Or is it a single float number, which tells me, for example, how uh, certain the model is or should be? Um, things like that. But now we are able to compare aspects of these two methods that might be vastly different. Very important. What is the interpretation that we should give to these numbers? And as we discussed with the heat map, with the example of the heat map, uh, do we do we as, do we say that? Uh, the pixels of the foreground is enough information or are we interested in the features that were extracted around that area? So this is important. Most of the literature are lacking this little step here, which is arguably also one of the most important ones, how to interpret those results. They give you kind of an intuitive way if you look at the research, but they don't commit to saying this is the way you should read it and this is the scope um, up under which you can read into those results. And then we can think also, is there any causal links into the, the statistics or the results of the, um, of the methods uh, or not, right? It doesn't have to be causal, but those are the useful things to ask about uh, when looking at XAI methods or evaluating whether these are sufficient for your use case, right? Just one simple example here uh, that we found in the literature not so long ago. These guys are not, or were not aware at, the mo uh, at that time uh, of the, um, the XAI framework, but we found it a nice example of how a, a XAI method addresses all the parts of the XAI framework uh, without they knowing that they were doing it, they did it. So they, they provide, of course, this, um, calm method, which is also another one that generates heat maps. And this is, this is the main contribution of their, uh, of, of this research. They went ahead and compare it to the state of the art of heat maps called CAM. And they said, well, there is no interpretation, but we're going to do a best effort to provide one interpretation. And this is, this is the one that we have. And now they went and analyzed what are the shortcomings of having this kind of interpretation, even though that might be the, the best one that there is available for this method. And they say, well, since there are problems with this, we are gonna change it a little bit and create our own. And this one comes with an interpretation. Right? So this is an actual research of a, an explanation method or an explanation that provides an interpretation. And this is just citing directly from their work. Uh, furthermore, uh, they define exactly, so what is the explanandum? For example, here, 
we see that they use the input that goes into the model. That's also the input of the explanation itself. The explanance is, of course, the output, which would be this uh, heat map where blue means negative and red means positive correlation. And very also interesting that they address what the non-functional requirement was that the whole contribution here, the whole paper was talking about. So they wanted to uh, very clearly address this kind of questions. So why is it class A and not class B? Right? And, and this is defining upfront what the non-functional requirement was that this explanation method was going to look for, was going to look evidence of within that, uh, within a given image classifier. Right? So we see that everything here, all the important um, parts of the XAI handbook or the XAI framework are being addressed. And uh, this is for us kind of a very nice example that it is possible or how, how to do it. Finally, in researching all this literature, we came with these realizations of what is missing in the XAI community and the XAI research. And we come with basically three recommendations. First of all, define the non-functional requirement ahead of time or be aware of what is the non-functional requirement if we're gonna, if we're gonna use uh, an XAI method, an explanation, uh, what is the, the non-functional requirement and state it, right? So having a, a statement, a clear statement that we can then uh, analyze and study or discuss about it. Then kind of a more general rule on, on this, not only define the non-functional requirement, but um, address the complete scope of the framework, right? So what is, what is the input to the explanation? What is the output? Uh, what is the actual process that uh, maps the input to the output in the explanation? So the, expon uh, the explanants and the explanandum. And as I mentioned before, one very important thing is to define which um, metrics, oh, well, especially the interpretation, right? Sorry, I, I skipped that one. Um, interpretation is very important to provide uh, a way to read those uh, tensors or those numbers that at the end, they're just numbers in a computer, uh, how to read them back in terms of your original problem. And finally, uh, one of the greatest challenges we have at this point is to define metrics for uh, being able to compare the explanandum, the explanants, and also the interpretations. How to do this is up still for debate and it's, it's being studied. Uh, but we also don't have a real consensus there. The important thing that we want to uh, you know, raise awareness for is that we need to do this and in terms of the main blocks of this uh, framework, right? So to come back to this um, sad story that we started our, um, our, our talk with, what would have happened here if we had something like the XAI framework for this, um, for these people that that were falsely accused of a crime. First of all, if the system um, was made or involved in ethics committee, for example, they would have hopefully realized that uh, this this system, one of the non-functional requirements, is that it has to be as effective um, for people of a certain skin tone as for another. So it has to be. Um, unbiased towards that kind of feature. So they could have done evaluations before selling it to the police, right? And then they could have defined sort of metrics or uh, investigate explanations that look into how biased the system was in terms of this, which would be the non-functional requirement. And finally, well, of course, give the interpretation if they define this, this kind of um, methods, if they are gonna, if they're gonna have, for example, a um, a face detector or an estimation of skin tone and then measure that if they are allowed to and how to read those metrics. If it's gonna be just a score that defines how dark the skin is or so and so on and so forth, then perhaps um, the situations wouldn't have arisen. All right. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope um, you've learned something and uh, I will be looking forward to your questions. I would give the word first to Connie. Hello, Sebastian. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> we didn't see each for a long time. So great. It's a very excited uh, um, research. 
but uh, um, I have a little doubt. I think the, the research is very meaningful um, if it is used in medical part, for example, the brain scan, someone is sick or not skin, depression or something. But such uh, in the evaluation part, you need expert knowledge. However, in your, for example, in your example, if it is only compared with the chicken uh, or compared with the dog or cat, they can make can not much um, meaning in the real world. But uh, if you can compare uh, explanations of the brain or some other medical um, area to make sense, however, it needs as a um, expert. And you want to also tell the experts something they didn't realize. So how you can evaluate? I think the evaluate part, um, part is very, for me, is very skeptical. It's at first you are difficult to find uh, such good expert. And the second, your algorithm will also have some different. Your algorithm can be um, good algorithm or bad algorithm or because of the threshold then we'll give different explanation. So it will give also, um, uh, so, I, so I think it will be very difficult to evaluate if the explanation is good or not, or meaningful or not, how you solve this problem. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I think you raised uh, important points there that we need to, uh, we need to address and probably I haven't mentioned uh, directly. Uh, first of all, you mentioned that, well, we started the talk by saying how critical the, the scenarios are, right? So high stakes scenarios and autonomous vehicles. And as you point out, medical domain, it's, uh, it's very um, critical to have this, this kind of um, uh, explanation methods available. And then I'm talking all the time about chickens and tigers and so on. And, and you're absolutely right. So this, this part of the talk is more using toy, um, toy scenarios, so just to, to be uh, accessible to everyone. But you're absolutely right. So in, in the sense that if the system is not critical, we perhaps do not need those explanations at all. Right? So we, we need to think also, with it, what, is my, what is my use case if I'm doing a recommendation engine for uh, getting mm, you know, uh, Spotify playlists or uh, new series in Amazon? And if I get the wrong one, it's not that critical. Right, and especially if it's every now and then. Um, so we first need to um, address that and, and say, define what is the, the scope? Is it critical or not? Do we need the explanation um, to justify because it's a critical scenario or perhaps because we just are curious about it and we want to improve it in any way? Um, you're absolutely right about that. And then also when you're talking, um, you were talking about the metrics, right? And the expert knowledge that we, that we need to gather. And you're, you're absolutely right. Depending on who is the consumer, if, if the consumer is a doctor, then we would have to know or um, fetch their expert knowledge to craft, for example, the right interpretation and craft the right explanation. You're absolutely right. And this is costly. This might be costly. The idea is that hopefully we can meet somewhere in the middle and create, um, create explanations that computer scientists can come up with that are also meaningful to domain experts. But this is, this is up for debate and argument and hopefully the research will show this, but uh, we're at this point not sure if that's possible. And uh, another question is the uh, algorithm, how long the complexity is it, it's very high or not? Well, this is a, a framework more to define the vocabulary that we should use to compare the, uh, the specific algorithms, right? So here we talked about, give me a second, um, two particular examples. So, or three particular examples. This one is one, uh, but this is independent of the, of the framework, right? And the same goes with, uh, goes for grad cam or kernel shap, right? So these are, these are not, um, special in any way. This, these are just two examples. So there's no complexity that you can measure for the framework itself, right? But uh, this can be something that you can ask about different methods and see which one is more costly. Okay. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
So hi, Sebastian, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, hello, it's Etske here, uh, working for IBM. So I also have a question to your framework. So you mentioned um, after the task explanation about the interpretation, and then you mentioned there the first time the expert knowledge, right? So the example with the veterinary use, so, uh, maybe not looking if there is a chicken or only on the um, looking for the wings, right? So mm -hmm. in this case, um, do you think, um, would it make sense that you involve the domain experts or the expert knowledge from the beginning? So maybe starting um, in the first step of defining of the task? Excellent question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. The non-functional requirements, I think this is, this is what you are aiming at, that whenever we're thinking about the non-functional requirements, we already are involving the experts if the, if the explanations or the consumer of the explanations are gonna be domain experts, that they should be the one even, I, I might even dare to say, they should be the ones uh, defining the non-functional requirements, right? So I would say in tandem because the computer scientist is the one that also defines the structure of what's going on here. So they can they can go back and forth, but there should be definitely an involvement uh, for domain experts in, in all of these steps. Thank you. That's so a and, point. Yeah, so and I, I also think that it could be, especially for domain experts who are not very deep in machine learning, right? For example, it could be a little bit difficult for them to make a clear, clear statement or a clear formulation of a non-functional requirement, right? So what do you think of how important is it to make a very clear statement on this? Um, I mean, you, you mean how, how uh, formal or how specific does the non-functional yeah. requirement need to be? Yeah. Well, it, it depends who's going to be the consumer, right? And if there's a domain expert, since I'm not a a veterinarian, it would be hard for me to come up with a, with a particular example, but um, of course, something that they as domain experts are satisfied with. And if we are thinking of uh, medical systems that are gonna be um, publicly available or you know available for, for uh, the masses, then of course that shouldn't depend on the opinion of one expert, but then you should involve a, a standard committee of, of experts and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, the, the more structure you have in the non-functional requirement, first of all, the easier it will be to map it to the low level domain, right? And the more structure you will have, the easier it would be to have the interpretation back, the more structure you have. And actually this um, reminds me of another idea that we haven't touched here on this talk, which is uh, models that are explainable by design. If, you, if you've heard also that, um, that term, and this would be, Essentially, if we map it here to the to the handbook, to the framework, what we're doing uh, with models that are explainable by design or interpretable by design is that they are already equipped with a bunch of these explanations and what they spit out is more structured output, right? And they would hopefully have an interpretation on their own, right? And, and this is a way to uh, very succinctly kind of talk about this uh, interpretable models. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Then I would I would jump in. Uh, what I would be interested in is, can you give a bit of examples for different kinds of interpretation? So I really, I, I got the idea of what's the kind of input that you give in, what's the kind of output, how would an interpretation look like? Is that is that natural language or that what, what kind of, yeah, topics are there? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. There are, in, in our review, we stumble upon essentially two kinds of uh, formats for the interpretation. The first one would be uh, natural language, as you just mentioned. And actually, we can come back to this slide where the interpretations were actually uh, being, being expressed in natural language, of course, with uh, math in there. But, at the end, you can say this this was sort of natural language. Um, perhaps one can think we can uh, work on formalizing this a little bit better. If you formalize it, then you can also verify it. If you can fully formalize it, then of course you can um, 
then verified in a computer again. But this is usually uh, the one that maps back from the low-level domain to the high-level domain. So we, we do deal with uh, natural language here. The other alternative that we find is when using causal models, causal models are usually um, defined the non-functional requirements are based on a causal graph. And then how to read that causal graph is given by the, the rules of uh, causal inference, right? So that there we sort of have an interpretation for free, whether this is suitable for um, domain experts or computer scientists or laymen will depend on the causal graph. But these are essentially the two kinds of interpretations we've stumbled upon uh, when doing our uh, review, the Churchill review. Cool, there you're actually already touching part of my second question that would be how, how much similar is the language that you are uh, describing here to the language of causality that, that Perl, for example, is using a little bit to set this up because he's also in the knowledge graph a lot of like what kind of input is connected to what kind of other inputs or what kind of variables are interconnected somehow that you have to define this beforehand to actually be able to explain later. So I would be just interested how much did you like borrow, so to say, some concepts of them or was that completely separate? And the second part of the question was, is explainability somehow a basic requirement so that we can actually do causality on top of it later? Ooh, that last one is, an interesting question to think about. Um, as I as I mentioned for for the first part, the the interpretation when using um, causal theory will be given by the the causal graph and what the information of each node is. Right? So we can we can think of each node uh, as um, each one of the pixels, and and there we are at a very low level kind of um, causal graph. However, if we think of um, the typical example in causality, the, the chicken and the sun and um, whether the, the chicken causes the sun to rise and so on. So we can also think in those kind of abstract um, ca uh, causal graphs and, and there your interpretation will change. So it will depend on what information is conveyed by the causal graph, uh, but the, and then it will affect the interpretation um, of that causal graph in, in one way or the other. Um, repeat me the second question because that, that's a lot to digest. Uh, the, the second one was, uh, I mean, you par partially already touched on that, but uh, is the explainability framework and explainability of a model a basic requirement, so to speak, to, to then put causality on top? Or can it, can it work with, without each other? So can causality work without explainability? Um, yeah, I, I think they, they could be independent. They could overlap the XAI handbook uh, benefits from um, causal theory because your, your work is pretty much already done by formal methods. Right? So there's, there's little room to uh, be vague or very abstract when defining, for example, the causal graph and, and what the interpretation is. However, the, the handbook itself is independent of uh, causality. We can also uh, find correlations that are still interested, uh, interesting to know. So mm -hmm. if, if we know that a, a particular model is biased, we don't we don't necessarily need to know why. If we, for example, in uh, the the example that I give that I gave at the beginning, if we just know that the model is biased by thirty percent and so on, so we don't need to know why to take it off the market, mm -hmm. right? And this is just a correlation. Um, so, in that way, the framework is independent of causality. Right, and causal inference can also be done at a very technical level, the completely formal structures. So they can also live without the interpretability framework in mind. And so they're they're kind of independent, but they can benefit a lot when uh, putting together. Awesome, thanks. Is there further questions from the audience? Then I have I have one more. Uh, about 
the the interpretation and the different kinds of um, methods that you can use on an algorithmic level? Is there somehow an idea or a concept of, because you talked also about the metrics for interpretations, for example, that if you can compare different kinds of metrics of a certain interpretation to then recommend it again and say, okay, I would recommend rather using a different kind of uh, detailed algorithm like shape values or whatever, so that based on the metrics, you can say, I would rather try an another one um, that can result into better interpretations, for example, if you can, if I described more or less correctly. Um, yes, yes. Um, essentially, this is the goal of this framework to, now we're both talking about the interpretation. We know what we mean by it. And what metric exactly, we don't know that this is uh, one of the, the big questions that are uh, the, the big follow-ups is to define what kind of metrics we can use to arrive at those, um, at those conclusions and saying, I'm gonna ditch this method. I'm gonna try this one instead because the interpretation is better. Or uh, if we look at the example that I gave from this other paper where they motivate their method on the vagueness and the problems that they identified from the potential interpretation, assuming that that was the interpretation, it has has problems. So they they work on that and they say if we want to address the um, the shortcomings of that interpretation, we actually need to change the explanation itself because we are we're lacking more structure. Mm -hmm. Right. So one of them, for example, is that the values are unbounded. Uh, to just give one particular example. And um, for, for values that are unbounded, they are difficult to read. What happens if the value is 10 and what happens if the value is 1 million? Is it is it uh, orders of magnitude more important or is it not? And the answer mm -hmm. is we don't know. So we needed something that is at least normalized and, and that reads better. It's, it, uh, it has a better interpretation. Very, very interesting. <laughs> Thanks again, Sebastian, for the time. And we hope that we can win you again for maybe another talk and then learn more about the, the metrics that you then, by the time, maybe have found out about interpretations. Yes, yes, I'll be happy. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and yeah, looking forward uh, to the next round. <laughs>